I feel like some. I feel like we're overthinking this a little bit. Um, I feel like maybe we're over. We're giving labels that don't need to be labeled. We have a hero. We're gonna put this hero on a journey. And who are the people? Or if it's a two-hander, we're it's like a buddy comedy or whatever we're talking about. Or if it's a husband and wife or whatever. Uh, you know, we're what's the story? We're what's the journey we're putting them on? And who are the characters we're gonna get in their way? You're listening to What the Hell is Michael Jammin Talking About? I'll tell you what I'm talking about. I'm talking about creativity, I'm talking about writing, and I'm talking about reinventing yourself through the arts. Hey everyone, it's Michael Jammin, and today we're going to answer the question, what the hell is Michael Jammin talking about? Well, today I'm talking about questions from my previous webinar. As many of you know, I do a, a webinar every three, three weeks or so where I talk about screenwriting. And uh, it's about an hour long and you're all invited and it's free. And I don't always have time to answer all these questions. Uh, but Phil is here with us visiting again. Hello, Phil. Hello. And Happy um, to be here. He's, uh, he, we're, he's gonna hit me with some of these questions we're gonna answer. Let me hit you baby one more time. Let's yeah. do it. All right, so um, uh, again, <clears throat> kind of grouped questions. Context for everyone, this was from a webinar talking about how professional screenwriters create, create great story characters. You got another really good webinar that a lot of people really like, which is um, how to tell, a, how to write a great story. Yeah. And so contextually, that's these are really more character based. There's some miscellaneous stuff. There's some breaking questions. We've kind of grouped them together. So as I go through these, we'll just try to keep them on theme. And let's get into it. Uh, yeah. Let's talk craft. I think craft is always a good place to start. Mm -hmm. uh, Anna Renee Chavez wants to know, what big differences are there between writing for animation versus live action? Great question. Oh, and uh, I just want to be clarify everybody. My webinars are free. Go to michaeljammin.com slash webinar to sign up. I, I change the topics, but whatever. So this woman wants to know, what's the difference between writing for animation and live action? Uh, not, not that much in terms of, and I teach them both in, in my course, <clears throat> the differences really are not that different. The only thing you want to think about is, well, ask yourself, why is this show animated? What's the advantages to making this show animated? <clears throat> so like in BoJack Horseman, it's a very real and grounded show, but you have horses talking and fish, fish talking or what, you know, like you couldn't do that in live action. So you're taking advantage of the medium. You know, if you have it animated, take advantage of it. Um, when I, my partner and I did Glenn Martin DDS, which is a show there, a stop motion animation, we would ask ourselves, what's claytastic about this mm. we call it claim because it was it wasn't claymation but we pretended it was claymation so how is this what's claytastic about this scene like is someone's head gonna come off uh so for example we did an episode where the character uh the, the boy got his head stuck in an elephant's ass you can't do that in live action mm. so you can do that in animation but the story itself is very the stories are very similar it's just that you take it you know you just you just take advantage of the medium yeah, awesome. And uh, I think another good example of this where uh, a choice was made to do live action, Rhett mm -hmm. Link's buddy system. You had mentioned to me at one point that it's basically just a cartoon. It's like a live action cartoon with yeah. how silly it is. Yeah. But they can't be as silly as they could if it was animated and they could do whatever they wanted. So it still kind of grounds it in this reality, but it's still a bit silly. Yeah, it could have been a cartoon, right? But uh, yeah. we, we, we would have gone even crazy. Like we did one episode where we turned Link into a... <laughs> into a robot, uh, because the character was like, it, my life would be easier if I was a robot. <laughs> so that probably would have been even better if it was an anim animated, but in real life, we just started putting him in like crappy robot costumes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but but it was funny, we, we turned him into a robot. So it was yeah. kind of broad. Love it. Julia Wells, considering extraordinary and ordinary pairing, what would you say about Friends, How I Met Your Mother, or shows that are more grounded? I think this is in reference in your webinar when you're talking about um, your characters and putting your characters together or how you oh. write your characters for a specific story. And there's a difference between extraordinary and ordinary. Right. Like you want something oh. extraordinary when you're pairing your characters together. Well, yeah, I mean, those, yeah, right. Those are all, most shows are like that. Most sitcoms, the characters are just normal people, um, yeah. uh, you know, and uh, yeah, it was kind of like ordinary characters, kind of in extraordinary situations where they were, you know, it, it would have been unusual. Like, you know, I'm trying to think of an example from Friends, but uh, all right. So they did an episode where Joey and and uh, 
Joey and uh, Cra- what's his name? <laughs> Not Kramer. Chandler. The other guy, Chandler, are going to s- sit in their chairs all episode. All right, ordinary guys kind of doing something extraordinary. They're going—they're not going to move from their chairs, and they're going to see if they get everything delivered, and they're going to eat and drink, and they're not going to get up, and you know, like stuff like that. So, I don't think it's any different from any other sitcom I've worked on, other yeah, than I, the characters. Or, you know, I, I just started rewatching How I Met Your Mother, which I've seen uh, who knows how many times, but it's a good background show while I'm working on stuff that's not necessarily like logical analytical stuff, and. Um, there's an episode where it's the Halloween party and he's the hanging Chad because he met the sexy pumpkin in 2001, uh, you know, at, during the election and uh, or 1999 or whatever. And so he's got Barney's got tickets to the Victoria's Secret model Christmas you know, Halloween costume. Party. Right. And he's trying to get his friend to this extraordinary thing and his friend yeah. won't leave because he wants to be at this party to potentially meet this girl on this rooftop again. Right. And it's the push and pull of come be amazing stop looking for love like you're losing it, it, it so it plays really well in that situation All right cool uh ahia saunders or Ajia sanders i apologize for ruining that how do you feel about basing a character on them knowing themselves or basing a character on yourself and your own doubts yeah do it all i mean you should do it you should totally mine your own life for stories and i have a whole web i have a whole uh module on this in the course, but, um, you, and you can disguise it too. So it doesn't, that, you, people don't have to know it's you, but you're just stealing parts of yourself uh, or parts of people you know as other characters, but you change it enough and change the name, but also change professions and change, you're just stealing attributes from people you know, so that they wouldn't know it. But yeah. that's what your life is, that's what your life is for. Your life is to steal, you know, things from. Perfect, Charles Shin. Do you have any tips or advice with coming up with great names for your characters? I spoke a little bit about this. In the old days, we used to have a baby naming book, my partner and I. And then now uh, it's kind of easy to go on the internet and, and or, or just, um, you know, when you, when, when in life you'll, you'll come across a street name. You go, oh, that's a good last name uh, for a character. Uh, you, you know, you kind of, I just kind of keep a list. What was one? I had one the other day. I added to my list. I can't remember, but you know, it was like a street sign. I go that I pass. I go. That's a good character's name. Yeah, yeah. I've, I've also seen our showrunners on Tacoma FD. Like, there's a random character as Chief Phil Dillon, and it's uh-huh. like, well, well, I'm Phil. The, the was the writer's PA, and I replaced yeah. Dillon the writer's PA. Yeah, it's funny. I didn't know they took that for you. I mean, that, that, they do. They tend to do that a lot. Where it's, at least Steve Lemmy does. He'll 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 yeah. just name characters after people he knows. <laughs> Yeah, there's like yeah. one line from Ike in an episode that I think you guys wrote. It's like Benjamin Duff or Benjamin Crump. And Benjamin. it's ben, ben Crump was our DIT oh. on the set. Right. Yeah. So just like throw people's names and give them fun stuff. Um, awesome. You also talked about, I think you talked about um, funny names that go together too at one point. That was like yeah. something you do. I talked about, I had a character named. Uh, what was his name? It was some, um, something. The third. It was something. The, the fourth. fourth right? Yeah. What was his name? Like God, I can't. It, uh, it, man. It was like. But it was like a bunch of things together that rhymed almost. or had like similar names. But I'd I'm, have to look it up. I can't. Oh, Dan. Dan, Dan Danforth the fourth. That's what yeah, it was. Dan Danforth I had a character named Dan Danforth the fourth. And I just thought that was a good name because. Dan Danforth is weird enough, but why did his parents have to saddle him with the fourth? Because, well, they felt like they had to because the father's the third. It's a generational thing. They can't. So they stuck this guy with his shitty name. And what is it? What's that going to... Having a name like that, you're going to be teased as a child. And so... And I thought the character was kind of a... uh, Kind of a feckless type. And he became a sheriff of a small town as a way of demanding respect because he'd been teased all his life to be named Dan Danforth the fourth. And so now he has a badge, but people still think he's a dipshit. And so I just yep. thought it was kind of a, a good name for a character like that who's kind of feckless. All right, jumping into the course and kind of character related topics. So these are a bit intermingled because a lot of what you talk about, and we even brought this up with Mike Rep and Kevin Lewandowski um, about how valuable that course, that character worksheet is. Yeah. But because this webinar was about character, there are a lot of questions about character. Um, so number one, Padanava, how to make, how do you make characters that the audience wants to know more about? Uh, 
Well, it's not so much the characters; it's just the story you give them. You know, so uh, that's it's the that that's not so much the character; that's the story. Mm. There yeah. you go. Yeah. Cookies and sugar. How mm. do we make characters diverse and not self-project? Diverse and not self-project. They seem very different questions to me. So, so this is a, I think, a really good question, and from context for for this. This person is a a, um, a minor, and they want to be a writer, and they've been told by their well-meaning, uh, you know, adults in their life and mentors not to do that because it's a waste of time because you'll never make it as a writer. And and oh. that was a question she'd asked at another point. Oh. Um, so this question really speaks to me of something I heard really early on when I was studying, which is, um, you are not your characters. Don't write your yourself into your characters. Which is kind of contradictory to the advice you give, which is yeah. writing your life for stories. Why not? Like, I don't know why they would give you that advice. Why not? Yeah. I, I, it might have been because people were just writing self indulgent material. Sure. That could have been. Sure. Uh, I know in, um, in, uh, on writing by Stephen King, he says that you are not your characters and it is a mistake to think that your characters will behave the way you would. So mm -hmm. if you find your character doing something you wouldn't do, it is your job to allow them to do that. And I find that a lot with my writing. There are many things I write where I would never do as a someone from a more conservative background who is religiously inclined. Like my characters say and do things all the time. I'm like, oh, where did that come from? Because that's not who I am. Right. But that's what it felt like needed to happen as that character was coming through me. And I feel it's my responsibility to just let that happen. Yeah. But the but the difference is to me is don't make your characters do and make the actions you would do. And if you're a no. more passive person, that's not a good thing for your character to be because your character needs to make choices. And that's yeah. the conflict of it all. But you know, Larry David on Kirby Enthusiasm, he's playing himself, but Larry David is not that person in real life. These are just, it's a heightened version of himself. Larry David knows when to hold his tongue. His character doesn't. His character can't let it go. Larry David, you know, so you're just playing, it's a heightened version of himself. It's the worst version of himself, which is why it's so funny. Yeah. Yeah. But, so the, but it's not, he wouldn't do that in real life. He, yeah. I mean, Larry, he wouldn't do that. Right. But if you look at yourself or even friends you have or people that you know, and you say like, there's, I've got this buddy who is like super quiet, but then when he talks, it is just like cuts with a thousand, you know, lashes because yeah. his wit is so sharp. It'll just take the wind out of your sails in a second. Mm -hmm. So if you have someone and you take that element, you say, I wonder how I can make that funnier. How, how could I take this tick that I have or that my wife has and just make it, turn it up to 11. That's where the comedy comes from, right? Yeah, and that's right. where the conflict comes from. So th that's what you're saying by mind your life for, for stories and put your characters in situations you've been in, but don't do what you did necessarily. You could turn it up. Yeah, turn it up a notch. That's it. It makes it fun and interesting. Yeah. Cool. Matthew Lavagna. I think he likes lasagna. Mm. Many people mm. begin with an idea for a character. I've always been led by the concept and the plot. Then I tailor the characters to fit within it. What are your well, thoughts on that method? Sure. I mean, that, you know, that, 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 that works fine. I mean, if you, if you, um, uh, if you can create someone who feels, still feels real, like I said, like, you know, even though Larry David is a heightened version of himself, uh, it still feels real. It feels like, he almost could, you know, he's not, it's not crazy. It's not beyond the realm of possibility that he would do that. So as long as your characters don't, it doesn't, as long as it doesn't feel like you're contorting the character to do something that your story requires, which would not be human behavior. You know, at the end of the day, these like, characters have to be human. Like jumping the shark? Yeah, or like jumping the shark, but also, um, you know, like often... My partner and I will write a scene and, and, and see if it will say something like, that's not human, a character, that's not human behavior. You're, we're just making the character do this because two writers in Hollywood need him to say that, yeah. you know? And, and, uh, and which is, fun. I mean, sometimes we'll laugh. We'll say like, why would a character say that? And then I'll say that, because we have four cameras on him and we have to, yeah. <laughs> we have to shoot something tonight. Um, right. Uh, but that's not the right answer. The right answer is, you know, it has to be human behavior. So tangentially related would be deus ex machina, right? Which is, you know, circumstance or coincidence getting your character out of trouble or, or kind of solving yeah. your problem. So it's it's not the same, but very similar as it's a lazy well, deus writing. Ex mana, 
Yeah, I mean, Deus ex machina, I believe, is Latin for God. God is in the machine. machine. Yeah. yeah, and so a God or a God can get you into trouble, or a coincidence can get you into trouble, but can't get you out of trouble. So if if God comes to the rescue and saves the day, that's considered bad writing. So an example for this would that people like to harp on is somehow Palpatine returned. What yeah. isn't that his name? Palpatine. Yeah, Palpatine. Palpatine. I didn't even watch it. I didn't watch it, so I'm not going to badmouth that movie. But that's what people say. Like somehow God came in, and when and everyone seems to roll their eyes at it. And again, I haven't seen it, so I really shouldn't say. It, but that's what yeah. I've heard. Uh, that that would be an example of maybe something that people don't. You know, they went too far. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How do you introduce characters? I normally have their name, age, and a short sentence which sums up their personality. I then allow them to show their character through their actions. Yeah, yeah. I mean, no one; those are stage direction, and no one wants reading stage direction. Wants to read stage direction. So I usually say, you know, what the character's name is exactly, a, 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 a few, you know, their, maybe a physical attribute or two, their age, and something about their personality that gets it real fast. You know, uh, like, here, here's a bad description. You see this a lot. You know. Uh, you know, Lucy, cute, but doesn't know. Girl next door, cute, but doesn't realize it. Or sexy, but doesn't know it. Like, uh, you, I, how many times have I got to see that? You just roll your eyes. So it's got to be better than that. Yeah. That's cliche. Awesome. Um, do you ever put anything related? I've, I've heard other writers recommend putting in cues for like clothing to help wardrobe understand how this person dresses or inform character. Is that something you ever consider? Only if it's absolutely necessary. Like if the character wears loose fitting clothing to hide their body, that makes sense, you know? Sure. But uh, other, but uh, unless it's absolutely necessary, we can have these discussions at the production meeting. We don't need to know it now in the script unless it's it. absolutely necessary. Great. Um, Tom Merrim, when you write characters, do you focus more on the personalities you want added to the mix or focus more on the role each plays or what they need to do in the story? Yeah, and that and that's what I teach in the course. I uh, every character has to be there for a reason, and they have to help elucidate the story, uh, or else it's just you're, you don't want to just m mash these. Even if you have ten great characters, like oh, they're all interesting, yeah, but maybe they don't fit together. They have to fit together to tell a story. The story is the most. Look, we all work for the story. The writers, the directors, the actors, we all serve the story, and that includes the characters. The story comes first. That's why it's so important to learn what story is. Yeah, great. Justin Kaiser, to develop your characters, do you focus on relationships more than the characters themselves? Uh, uh not well. I, more. I mean, I, I always think, what's the relationship between this character and the other character? You know, uh, I mean, you may need to know that if you have a, a father and a son, and you want to know how they interact, and the kid, maybe the kid's under the father's thumb. And at the end of the show or movie, he's going to stand on his own two feet and, you know, and defy his father. That's important that you might need to know that. But um, I don't need, if that's what the story is about, then yeah, I need to know the relationship. But I don't need to have, I don't need to have all the answers. Yeah. Just the ones that are pertinent for the story. Right. And when you get into the course, you'll learn that. There's this awesome sheet that you have that you were provided yeah. that was given to you. Was it Steve Levitan gave it to yeah. you? Yeah. Yeah. And it's basically like defining all of these nuances of your character so that you can build them out to be someone unique. And you clearly see a pattern. And this kind of relates back, I think, to Cookies and Sugar's question. I'm assuming this is universal, not just a me thing, but it's definitely a, a Phil Hudson thing. When mm -hmm. I create my characters and I start using that spreadsheet, I start noticing like, oh, they are all very similar. We yep. gotta mix that up. So let's mm -hmm. fix this, let's fix this. And so those are like, I have specific things I go to or lean towards and it's like, I need to fix that. And that allows me to create um, conflict, creates yeah. you know differences in the way people see things. It also empowers me when I'm writing these characters to know how they would talk about this specific thing or react in this situation in a way that empowers the story to be better and serve their role that they've been given. So. Here's an extreme example of that. It's like, let's say you're writing Ocean's Eleven and you have, I don't know, I guess you have 11 characters or whatever. You got the, the brainiac, you got the suave guy, you got the, the bomb cutter who, who's a loose cannon, you got the thug, you got the nerd or whatever. Every character in that group has their own distinct 
not only like part personality, but almost archetype of personality. Like why, why there shouldn't be overlap there. Are like, and, and then no, that's an extreme example. But even if you're writing something more grounded and real, you'll, you'll, uh, or intimate rather, you'll, you'll ask, you'll have the same conversations with yourself. So why do I have two heartthrob characters? I only need one, you yeah. know, because you want to have different viewpoints and, um, uh, viewpoints in the episode. It, it, we talked a little bit about love actually uh, in the last podcast we talked about, we did a Q&A and I mentioned love actually is about looking at love on Christmas time from a hundred, you know, whatever, 15, I don't know how many storylines, whatever, eight storylines. And each character has a very specific kind of role and there's no overlap and there shouldn't be. Cause if there is what, we don't need two characters with that same point of view. You know, this, this is this is a work of art. You don't need two, you need just one. Yeah, yeah. And going back to how I met your mother, um, there's really three, kind of four different characters there in this group. There's like the couple, Marshall and Lily, and there's Ted, our protagonist, and there's Barney, and then there's Robin. And they all reflect this different opinion about relationships and, and dating in New York City. You've got the couple that have been together since college, and they're together, and they just love each other all the time. The one seeking true love, the player who just wants to hook up with as many women yeah. as he can, ironically played by Neil Patrick Harris, who's gay, and he does a great yeah. job of playing that person. And then yeah. you have Robin, who is afraid of love and you know kind of withdraws from love and that creates that ecosystem where they're all playing yeah. off of each other. They all have different viewpoints, yeah. I'll also say, you know, I'm working on this feature that um, I haven't written a feature in a long time, and I've got the story that I really like, and it centers around a family situation. And I'm thinking about my family and my brothers and my relationship with my siblings, and it's like, we were all raised the same. We are all very different people. We mm -hmm. have fights because there are things we absolutely disagree on, but then there's always this layer of relationship and we have understanding that even when we get really mad at each other to a certain degree, we know we're always going to come back together, except there's always that thing dangling out there that maybe we won't. And I have one sibling who's like that. I don't know that I could have a same conversation with her that I could with my older brother the same way I would because she may never want to talk to me again because she's just mm. a bit more sensitive. So it's mm. like, okay, how do I look at all of these relationships here? And just because we all come from the same place and we had the, almost the same experiences, we are all very different. Yeah. Right. So Cameron Barnes, he said, um, Michael said a cast of characters is, should be in constant conflict, but does that actually just mean constant conflict throughout the story? But what else would it mean? I mean, yeah, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, yeah, I mean, they should, conflict maybe talk have about to, constant conflict. Uh, maybe just address that. Well, conflict doesn't have to be people fighting. It could be passive aggressive. It could be people. Uh, caring very much for each other. The mother and the, you know, you've seen this trope before, the mother, the overbearing mother trying to get the daughter to be happy and uh, settle down and find a man, or, you know, whatever. Like she's just in her life. That's conflict. A mother who's constantly meddling and she means well and the daughter knows she means well, but she keeps stepping on her toes. You've seen that story a million times. We've seen it because it works. So that's conflict. Um, you know, yeah, but if it was, can't we, what about a show where everyone was always getting along? Well, that's boring. I'm, you know, unfortunately, that's just boring. That's the, yeah. that's, that's the scene right before everything goes south. Yeah. You know, that's what that is. You have, yeah, you have one scene like that, and then it goes and, south. And it's typically not that it's all okay. It's that people are just kind of eggshelling, walking on eggshells around each other to maintain the peace in this moment, right? Yeah. Because it's going to go nuts at any moment. Yeah. yeah. Drama is conflict, guys. So that's it. You know, drama is conflict. But that's also just life. And I think that's why we watch it. It's life is not perfect harmony at all times with everybody. Like there's things like. Yeah, but even if you had a scene where a young couple's in love and everything's great. Okay, great. That What's one scene? They met, boy meets girl, they fall in love. Great. How many scenes? Why, uh, why do you leave the towels on the floor? Like why he leaves yeah, the towel something is gonna Yeah, something is gonna have to happen where. Mm -hmm. When you take your toothbrush out of your mouth, it flicks toothpaste on the on the on the mirror, and you never clean it, right? Yeah. That's the stuff that eats at couples. Yeah, so you need stuff like that. You know, everyone loves Raymond. They were a happy couple. They were, had a happy marriage, but they had, you still have to fight. Or else, what are we watching? Yeah. What's the difference? But that's also like fighting in a relationship is what makes your relationship better. Like if you can get through those things or get, you know, and fighting doesn't mean like screaming and yelling and throwing stuff at each other. It could just be disagreements or yeah. heated conversations. It's like you got to get through the conflict 
uh, yeah, to come to getting, a resolution. Yeah, right. I this right. thing bothers me. This thing bothers you. How are we going to fix this? Because we live together and we're going to be together forever. So let's figure this out because it's going to bother me every day forever. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Matthew Lavagna back. What's mm. the difference between a villain and an antagonist? I don't know. I mean, um, I, I mean, a villain, I guess, is an arch form of, you know, a villain is sounds like somebody who's real, real, uh, a heightened antagonist. That's what it sounds like. And an antagonist doesn't have to be a villain. It could just, you know, if you have, a, like I said, a, a, a daughter and a mother and the mother's overbearing, then the mother's an antagonist. Doesn't mean she's a villain. The stepmother is the villain, you know, in in, in uh, Cinderella. So it's just a heightened antagonist, I suppose. But we're splitting here. I, I don't, we don't have to. I don't think we have to worry about that, really. I mean, it's yeah. it's like an academic question, I think. You might say Thanos in in Marvel, the Marvel universe, is the villain because he's got this big ex- existential threat. But I think mm-hmm. one of the things you highlight, um, definitely in my writing, is your antagonist still needs to be likable. Like they need, not likable in the sense, but we need to understand that they think they're the hero. And in his this case, like Thanos wants to prevent genocide because his his world went through this. And so his way of doing it is by killing half of the people in existence to prevent this thing from happening. Yeah, I mean, I mean when you end. think of like, like think about Landa from uh, uh, Quentin Tarantino's um, uh Hans glorious Landa. bastards, yeah, yeah, and glorious bastards. What a great villain! I mean, he was a great villain. He was, you know, the 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 Jew hunter, the the Nazi. Like, man, that was a badass guy. But um, he was complex, and there was something so compelling about him, even though what he was doing was so incredibly vile and offensive. And so, you know, that that's when you kind of you humanize you you humanize your villain. You make it. It just it's, it makes your writing so much richer. I mean, the fact that he spoke so many languages and he was educated. He's charismatic. And, uh, and, yeah, yeah. He was charismatic and yet still. Pol- and very polite. Thank you so yeah, much very for inviting polite, me in. But May was... I ask you for some milk? Like, yeah. Yeah. The Jews so are underneath kn- me right now, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah. And you just didn't know where you stood with the guy. So he was just a, like a, a very nice guy doing awful, awful things. So yeah. that's great writing. That scene when he's like sitting down with Shauna like to to go over the theater and he's like vetting her and he's yeah. like putting cream down for her and he's like you know yeah. he knows who she is. Yeah. It is unspoken subtext. He is aware that this is the girl that got away. Mm-hmm. And and you see it in her reaction when she leaves and she's hyperventilating and she just yeah. kept it together. Right? Yeah. Whew. You know, and he he was like a mercenary. Then you find he, out later that that's all part of his plan. Like, mm-hmm. you, you know, this is how he's going to get out. Great writing. That's all yeah. there that is. That's all that movie is, is great writing. Which is Followed why up by great acting. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> and great production and great editing yeah. and great everything. Yeah. That's all that was, though. All right. Luke Veltz, how do you ensure that the story around the character matches uh, the lesson that they need to learn? How do I ensure? Can you say it again? How do I ensure what? So, so this, pres- this is a presupposition that your character needs to learn something by the oh. end of your script. So I how don't... do you ensure that the story around that character gets them to the point that they learn something? Well, okay. I don't believe characters have to learn anything. I do think they have to grow at some, or else why did you put them on a journey if not to them? It has to be changed. You're changed in some way. <clears throat> if you take a character and you take them to the top of uh, uh, Mount Everest, they have to be changed in some way. It's or else why did you take them there? Uh, so uh, it doesn't mean they have to learn a lesson. Uh, they could be they could be worse off. But um, if if your story doesn't if your why do you, a story is a journey and if why go on the journey if we're not going to get a view? And the view better better be something interesting. Yeah. You know why why did you take me on this long trip? And you know. And if the character didn't in some way change or grow, it doesn't mean learn a lesson, just changed in some small way. Uh, Why didn't we take him on that trip? Why did we go there? Why did you waste our time? You know? You, you and, and by the way, there are there are bad movies where that where this doesn't happen. And I and I always feel like, well, why did you just waste my time? Right. And so just because there's bad writing out there doesn't mean we have to participate in it. Doesn't mean we have to add to it. I think there's a an inclination, and I've seen this in myself and many other writers in film school and definitely here in Los Angeles, that you want to buck the trend and buck the system and you don't want to follow story structure and you want to do your own thing. It's almost like you want to reinvent the world of writing and you also want to 
play into tragedy and disappoint, expectate, defeat ex- audience expectations and all these things. And that's artful writing. And I think what I've learned from you in the course and being in the writer's room is that those things serve a purpose and you can still do those things, but you do it in a surprising way and it works because there's a structure to it. Yeah, I mean, I don't, we don't all, everyone wants to reinvent writing, reinvent the story. Look, the story works. Like it's been working for thousands of years. We don't, you can make a good living writing compelling stories. And when I watch a story that's compelling and that works, I don't think, wow, they just reinvented the story. I don't think that. I just think they just, they told a really good story. They, I feel like they're doing what I'm doing, but maybe better <laughs> or in a different, on a higher level. I don't think they just completely change the, with with some small exceptions. Like I like sometimes I'll watch a, like for example, Inception, Christopher Nolan. Like, oh, like I, 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 I can't, I've watched it four times. I still don't know what it's about. I still can't follow it. It's obviously a great movie, but um, I don't think we have to all write like that in yeah. order to tell a great story. And, and I think he just uh, announced kind of what it, what is happening. Like he kind of just revealed that during the Oppenheimer interviews. So uh-huh. you can go look that up on, on the Google if anybody's interested. Oh, okay. But, but yeah, it's, I mean, that's his style and it's very much like his cinescope, I think is what it is, or it's cinescope. Like his logo is a maze. Like it's, it's a labyrinth. Yeah, oh. He's kind of telling you this is his way of telling That's stories. how he does it. And that's how and he thinks. Me- and- it started with Memento and right. it started with like even other stuff he directed but didn't write, which I'm blanking on it, but it was like, it's like one in Alaska and it's like psychological thriller. But yeah, all of his stuff is that. And that's his motif and his style. I'd go so far as to say that the guy's kind of a genius. And so unless you think you're a genius too, maybe don't try to reinvent, like, I don't think I'm a genius. But that said, I, I couldn't I, I couldn't write anything like Memento. I couldn't, I, it hurts my head to think about it. And I enjoyed a Memento and uh, Inception, really loved it. I couldn't come close to it. I write, what I do is I write comedy and I'm very good at that, my one little thing. And uh, that's okay. You have, every, we all have our one little thing that we're good at and you have to just lean into it. And, and uh, it, we don't, I don't have, Chris, Christopher Nolan doesn't write comedy, right? Which is good. Let's, he has a thing that he does and we yeah. love what he does. And right. so- he doesn't have to, we don't all have to be experts at everything. Right. Yeah. Justin Kaiser, how do you decide that another character is needed to advance the story or if that itch, attribute, moral, personality can be added to another existing character? Oof. How do I, you know. I, I, I guess the qu- with- kind of the question is like, how do you know when you have enough characters to, to in your story? <laughs> it's like, well, it's a little different if you're writing a TV show. If a TV show, you need to write a, you have to have a cast and it has to be conflict. You want to have like, let's say five or six characters that always are going to always be in conflict with each other week in and week out as you tell different stories. If you're writing a movie, you really want to think about who's the star of this movie or if it's a two-hander, who are the stars? If it's a buddy buddy cop movie or whatever, these you have two cops or it's a buddy buddy movie or a road trip movie, you have these two characters and you only have the other characters as needed to help tell the story, the journey you're putting those two characters on. So if you take um, a good example, since we're mentioning buddy comedies, uh, Midnight Run. So Charles Grodin and Robert De Niro, it's a buddy comedy. You're putting it on, and a road trip comedy, or uh, whatever, not so much of a comedy, but drama. And you're putting them on a uh, on an adventure, so you just need obstacles to throw in their ways. So you have Dennis Farina's character, who's the mobster, and uh, you know, but it's we're not following Dennis Farina's story. It's we're following Robert De Niro's relationship with Charles Grodin. That that's it. Everyone else is there to help tell Robert De Niro's story and Charles Grodin's story. Yeah, Easy Rider, very similar, right? You've got these two bikers, and you've got you know their lawyer Jack uh, Jack Nicholas, and then. It's about them and this experience of going across America, right? In yeah. the seventies, it's it's not about the hippies they meet at the waterhole in Santa Fe. It's it's about those and what happens to them as they go through America. Yeah. yeah. So. Julia Wells, and how do you prevent the worst characters from being so far outside their well wheelhouse that they can't possibly succeed, or it becomes unbelievable? And this is in reference to this kind of gold nugget you've been talking about recently. In your yeah, which. Uh, Please, everyone, please come to my webinars about, this one's about character. She's talking about character, that she, but I do another one on story and they're free. You go to michaeljammer.com. And you're going to get a lot of, a lot of these questions for people like 
a lot of this is coming out of it's in context in the webinar. So you're yeah. hearing this lesson and these very important, you know, principles for writers. And these are questions coming out of that. And this is one of those questions referring to a tip you give in the webinar about mm -hmm. how to write characters that that a professional writer would use. So she wants to know how do we how do you make sure that your character is not so off the map that people don't like it or something? Yeah, cuz the point you're making here right is you don't want a perfect character. You want the worst character for a situation. Yeah. So how do you yeah. make how do you not make the situation so bad that that per character can't navigate it? Yeah, well, I, I think what you do is you you have your character and get better. So improve on it. So like I talked about one of the examples I gave in the webinar was uh Arya Stark from Game of Thrones, yeah. and we gave her the one one of the hardest storylines, which was, you know, she had she was a little girl, her family was murdered, and now she decides she's going to avenge the death of her family. And I'll talk I talk more about this in the webinar, so I'm not going to go into too much detail. But Arya Stark is the worst character to um, give this journey to avenge the death. She's a she's like an eight year old. <laughs> And she's yeah. tiny. How could you? And so you have to cut. So we give her skills. So we get, we slowly take her down this path where she learns skills and becomes a great fighter little by little. She learns from this, the dance, the dance. Uh, yeah. You learn dancing. those, you learn those attributes, but it's there. Like the seeds are there. She's interested yeah. in sword play. She's a bit of a tomboy. She wants to know these things that her, her sister is the opposite. Wants to be the queen, wants to yeah. marry the king. Like, you know, that whole thing. So we put her, she's the worst person to put on this journey, but we slowly give her the skills on these little storylines that we give her uh, to uh, to become the one who kills the Night King. The, like the, uh, you know, the, no one can kill this guy. He's made of ice and somehow she can't, she, she's, you know, but had we not put her on this journey, she, she would have been the first one to die. Hey, it's Michael Jammin. If you like my content, and I know you do because you're listening to me, I will email it to you for free. Just join my watch list. Every Friday, I send out my top three videos of the week. These are for writers, actors, creative types, people like you. You can unsubscribe whenever you want. I'm not going to spam you. And the price is free. You got no excuse. To join, go to michaeljammin.com slash watch And now back to what the hell is Michael Jammin talking about? Yeah, it's all great, man. It's such a good show. Yeah. yeah. Darlene Smith, can you over can you ever over create a character? I don't know what that means. Over create, you know, overwriting is a thing. I don't think this is. Um, it's like, can you think too much about your character? And like, I know a lot of people spend time writing like full biographies about their characters. Oh, oh and god, that kind of stuff. Yeah, I don't. You know, as as you write, you learn more about the character. You know, it's so weird when people say, "I wrote." They say, I, I have the, the pilot, the Bible, and the first three seasons of my show mapped out. Really? So you're, in other words, you're, you're, you're saying you're not willing to discover any of this as you go, you know, because mm -hmm. they just have it mapped out on a piece of paper. It's like in, the, in a real writer's room, we got a team of writers working on this. And over the course of eight seasons, we've, we're learning more and more about the characters as we, dis as we go. It's not, Breaking Bad wasn't fleshed out in the pitch. You know, we didn't know, you know, Jesse Pinkman wasn't even going to be a main character in it. Right. So, um, yeah, I, you learn that you learn about your characters as you're writing. You see what works and what doesn't work. Uh, you don't, you don't, if you, I, I think you could, there's a temptation to spend all this time th overthinking your characters without even putting a, a, a word on the page. Yeah. Look, it looks like writing. I, and I, th I think that might be, this is procrastination. Yes, it's it's yeah. world creating. I think I told you like maybe eight months ago, nine months ago. Uh, there was a kid who was in film school. He messaged me and he's like, "Hey, I'm really interested in this and writing, and I just love creating worlds. Like I love world building. I love doing all this stuff, and mm. like that's my favorite part of this." And it's like, cool. None of that matters if you don't have a character we want to watch because that is all that matters. Is what is this character? What is their yeah, you're, the journey you're, they're going on? It's, we get, it's procrastination. It feels yeah. like it. And look, this might be like a bit of a, a gross word to use to describe this, but it is masturbation. Mm -hmm. It is just you are doing this for self-indulgent reasons yeah. to make you feel like you're writing. And it's literally not moving the chain, which is pages, like words on the page, words on the page, words on the page. 
my partner and I will get we've gotten called out on this more than once where the the executives will look at our, an outline or a beat sheet and they go, I don't understand this character. And we're like, well, that's because we don't really understand the character yet either. We we plan on finding it as we write, but they get mad. We need to know now. All right. Well, we we were just kind of pulling the wool over your eyes. We'll figure it out, you know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Because we're going to find it when you write it. I don't know what to tell you. I don't know what to tell you. We thought about it. Uh, we're not there yet. We have to discover it as we write. Sorry, but this is how it goes. I, I want to highlight here, Michael, too, that this is for there are a lot of people who might hear what you say about like story structure matters. And there's a there's a structure that you need to stick to. And you talk very in your free lesson, michaeljammon.com slash free. There's a whole bunch of free resources on that page. One of those is this free lesson about story. And, and you talk in there about mm. Picasso. And Picasso was a master at like 14. And then he yeah. learned and created his own version of art that's worth millions and hundreds of millions of dollars now by mm. the time he was 80. So he had like 65 years, if my math's right, of figuring out how to make his own thing and reinventing this. But it's grounded in the the rules of art and painting yeah and you, you talk about the structure and how it matters but in the same breath you're saying like find it as you go find it as you go and there's a balance there and i, I think yeah. very often definitely myself very black and white and there's a lot mm -hmm. of this you need to understand the principles so that you can break the rules but you also need to understand when yeah. to focus your time and when to shift and that i would venture to say just comes with time you got to get in and do it a lot. And over and over and over again, and you'll learn. And then that's how you, you know, a lot of times you I, will have the perfect character, all the perfect characters. And we'll start writing and we go, uh oh, none of this is working. So what we thought was perfect is not working. And I, how do I know it's not working? Because the words are not coming out on the page. It's just not working. So, yeah. And don't be so, and don't be so damn precious about your story and your characters and your idea. Just get it out and move on. Like you just, it's reps. You got to get your reps in. All right. Cookies and sugar. Um, how do you keep a romance novel interesting? How do you create conflict between the two characters while still having them come together in the end to date? How do you write villains in? And part of me is like, I think we just answered this with the toothpaste and like all that stuff we were talking about. It's you can get there, but Hitch comes to mind for me, right? Mm -hmm. It's the I right characters. That. Yeah, Will Smith is like the dating expert and he helps guys who mm -hmm. kind of suck at dating get girls that he, they like. And Eva Longoria's character is like a gossip writer and she finds out about this guy and she's going to go find him and hunt him down. But at the same time, she falls in love with Hitch, the guy. And then it kind of comes out later that she feels like he played her and it's because her friend got some douchebag who he wouldn't help Mm -hmm. made some reference and so it all kind of boils over at the end and it's about helping a guy fall in love who's in love with this heiress getting her to fall in love with him because he's a klutz and he can't do it himself and all the things she fell in love with were him his mistakes not the stuff hitch taught him how to do right right it's all the sincere him stuff but that is a great example of this is a, a rom-com this is a romance story this is go watch when harry met sally which is the best rom-com yeah. ever yeah and, and and so when you keep your you know it's boy meets girl boy gets girl boy loses girl that's the middle right then boy gets girl in the end again or not or not but uh getting together at the end you know they you need to get your characters they usually get together earlier and then something goes south yeah. Yeah, and that would, you know, uh, that would that would be probably be your second act break when they when they break up for whatever reason. Yeah. So, go watch Harry Met Sally. That's a yeah. brilliant, brilliant rom, rom com. Awesome. E. G. wants to know how do you overcome difficulties with writing dialogue? Acts uh, broken down, but having a hard time with dialogue. Well, yeah. I mean, there's a couple things going on. W one. You can record your dialogue into a tape recorder or you know whatever digital recorder and play it back, and it should sound natural. It should sound the way people talk. You can go to a coffee shop and listen to people how they talk. Uh, you know that that to me that's the fun part. If you're having problem writing it, it could it could easily be because you don't know what your characters should say, and if you don't know what your characters are saying, you don't have a dialogue problem. You have a story structure problem if you don't know what your characters should say. So I, I suspect that's what's going on. I suspect this person doesn't have a dialogue problem. They have a story structure problem. That was my thought too, yeah. because it's pretty easy to know what you need to get. You shouldn't have a scene where people are just showing up to talk. That does nothing for us. Yeah, yeah. Right. 
It's it's that critique I have, and I've noticed even in my own writing early on, which is there's a lot of people doing things and nothing's happening. Yeah, that's a that's a bad note to get. By the way, guys. yeah, you don't want yeah. That. Doc B, is there a method by which uh, to place arc points the character will learn something or experience that helps them grow, or do you let the story um, find the right moment for character evolution? Can you repeat it? Yeah, I had to kind of it kind of was tough to get through. So is there a, is there a, a process or method that you use to put in plot points that or story points that require your character to grow or evolve? Well, the, again, we're talking story structure. That's yeah. what they need to, that's what I teach in the course. Uh, I, there is a process. Yeah. Yeah. But I again, recently, go ahead. Character grows, don't, characters don't have to grow. Uh, they, they have to change, but they don't have to learn a lesson. Okay. But go on. Yeah. Yeah, and that's again, that's that advice. It kind of just hangs out there. Is your character needs to learn something. Your character needs to learn something, and and just kind of hanging myself out here again. The first lesson you, first question you asked me when you're giving me um, screenwriting advice is you asked me the question, "What is the definition of a story?" Hint, hint. That's go get the free lesson on michaeljammon.com slash free because yeah. it's the same question and you teach this principle. And I said it's a hero who goes through trials and ends up better in the end. And your response was, "What about King Lear?" Yeah. Here, here's another example of that. Uh, go watch a movie called Manchester by the Sea with uh, Casey Affleck. And in it, he plays a guy who's responsible for the death. There's an accident. He's responsible for the death of his wife and his child. And he's living with this horrible guilt. He won and, an Oscar for that, right? That's the one he won the Oscar for? I don't know, but it was a great performance. Uh, and so he's, he feels responsible for the death of his family. And I think he may have been an alcoholic or not. I don't remember, but... And then he forges a relationship with his nephew. And you think maybe this relationship's gonna save him. And you get to the end and you think we've taken Casey Affleck's character on this journey where maybe he's not gonna be depressed anymore. Maybe he's gonna allow himself to change and grow and he can't. And so that character does, goes on a whole journey, but really doesn't change. And is a beautiful, beautiful yeah. movie. But again, the, the emotional journey is there, but he decides at the end, I, I, I can't grow. I can't change. Yeah. W Without a Trace is another great film with Ben Foster. And he's living in the wilderness. He's a vet with PTSD. And he's living kind of in the wilderness outside of Portland with his daughter. And then Child Protective Services kind of gets involved. And he kind of goes on the run with her. And they escape. And then at the end, they end up in this town. And there are these kind people who want to take her in. And they're offering to give them a place to stay and take care of them. And then one night he like is packing his stuff and he has to kind of leave his daughter behind because he can't deal and she can't deal. She can't deal with living in the woods and she shouldn't because she's a teenage girl and should have a life. And they have this beautiful, I don't want to spoil it for anyone else watching, but there's this beautiful moment where at the end you just know they're both okay and they both got what they need, but they, it's not what you want for them. You want these two to figure it out. You want him to get better, and he just can't cope with civilization, society. Yeah, good stuff. Uh, Matthew Lavagna, Lavagna, what are your thoughts on withholding information from the audience to allow them to work things out for themselves rather than spood feed them everything? Good, good question, Matthew. That is something uh, um, we struggle. I struggle with that. It's not an easy task. That's kind of the difference between writing, in my opinion, writing um, smart writing and maybe not so smart writing. So if I were to tell a, a children's a show, like a family show, you know, middle of the road family show, uh, kind of a hokey, I, I would break that story the same exact way I would break an episode, let's say of Marin, which was a very sophisticated dark comedy for adults. I would break it the same exact way. The difference is for the family show, which kids are supposed to watch with their parents, I would spell it out a little more. I'd, st I'd do a little more spoon feeding. And for the adult show, for Marin, I would make the audience, I, I just wouldn't say it as much and the audience would have to figure it out on their own. And people would think, oh, Marin is smart because I'm making them do the work. Whereas it's, it's literally the same, the same steps, the same beat board, it's all the same, except I'm making, I'm spoon feeding the family show, but I'm making Marin, uh, on Marin, I'm, I'm, I'm letting the audience do little work. And when you make the audience do more work, they feel it's a smarter show because they have to be smarter. They have to pay attention more. And so that's, in my opinion, is the difference between a smart show and let's say a not smart show. 
Yeah, for the newer writers, there are two terms that come to mind. One is subtext, which I could not wrap my head around when I was first figuring learning writing, but it's absolutely critical to writing professionally. Is you need to understand it's like what's not being said. It's being yeah. said but not said. That that subtext. And then the other is this principle of audience inferior and audience superior, meaning your audience doesn't know what's going on versus your audience knows more than your characters know what's going yeah. on. And they're tools you use. So like in a horror film, you might use audience superior to say, oh, no, don't go in there. Don't go in there because you know that the killer is in there. But then you might use audience inferior in a horror film for the jump scare where Leatherface pops out in the woods and gets your kids. Like, So they're just tools of the craft and you use them applicably. On this, on this, on this note, I've talked about the show Bluey. When Bluey is very popular right now on Disney Plus, it's a kids show about you know based their dogs and it's they're even it shows from Australia, and they're fascinating and they I love watching them probably more than my kids love watching them because they are very smart, very well written, and there's this was something I just saw on on TikTok yesterday. It's, it's a new term I learned called a rainbow baby. Have you ever heard that term? Rainbow baby is the baby born immediately after like a miscarriage or a stillbirth or something like that. And it's a very emotional thing for parents, right? And there's an episode where Bluey is kind of acting out how her mom and her dad fell in love and kind of how Bluey got there and her sister Bingo's helping her act it out. And Bingo's got this uh, balloon underneath her belly to pretend like she's pregnant and she's playing the mom. And they don't tell you this. And I've watched this episode probably five times until someone pointed this out. There's this moment where the balloon pops and you see Bluey's dad grab his wife's hand and they hold hands and you just like, like I get emotional as a, a husband mm-hmm. with kids. It's like, oh, they went through a miscarriage like, yeah. and they don't tell you. Right. The kids will never know. But as an adult, it's like, wow, there's a yeah. level to this that is just beautiful. Yeah. Right? So that's, that's subtext and it's audience inferior. It's all those things that yeah. we we're talking about. So I'm going to wipe my tears now into my microphone. Yeah. Um, yeah. A couple questions left, and I know we're going to be a little bit long here, guys, so apologize you're getting a bunch of questions answered. The Lovely Bones 052, how do you make characters' voice different than your own? Which I think is kind of the projecting question we talked about earlier. But do you have any about voice? Uh, you know, I, I, that's the fun part. If you're writing for Fraser Crane, you speak like Fraser Crane. You know, we, you look up words in the in the thesaurus, so he uses smart language instead of you know good and bad. He'll say delicious and magnificent. Uh, uh, how do you do that? That's that's the fun. That's that's the imitation part where we get to imitate carrot people. So you yeah. listen, you use your ears, and you you mock people. Yeah, and you have experiences you've talked about before. Yeah, Joshua and Ashley Earls Bennett want to know. Uh, this is about miscellaneous questions, by the way. Is there a character sheet for stories that have taken place in the past? And I think this is a reference to a story Bible and not the one you do for pitching, but the one in the writer's room. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I don't look at it. I mean, most shows keep a Bible. Uh, I don't, for whatever purposes, I don't even, I don't even know why, but they keep a record of all these characters and stories that have been told. So if someone needs to know for at some point in the future, it's there, but uh, I, I don't reference them. Here, here's an Easter egg on why you might have this because we didn't have this on Tacoma FD. Mm-hmm. And then there was like a point where um, in this season of Tacoma FD, they're going to rename the street Panese Way. And so we need to know what is the street of the firehouse. And so I had to go dig through every last episode of the script, every script from season one through, and you find out, well, we've had two addresses because someone wrote it down. Or I know we ran into a plot point where it's like, we need to pick a specific game that was missed as a plot point for this episode and why Terry's mad at his daughter because that's the night she was born. But in the timeline, we might say she was this age and then now you have to go, you're stuck trying to find an important event in this specific year because you have to maintain the continuity of the story. Yeah, that's and that's a good example, right? So like if, if we have an episode and we want to like, okay, we want to bring back uh, uh, Eddie's- Sp- Spatchcock. Yeah, whatever. A girlfriend that he had in the first season one. What was her name again? I can't remember. We want to bring this character back. We'd ask the writer's assistant. The writer's assistant would check the Bible that they kept a record of because we as the writers might not remember because it was yeah. it's like a trivia. It's trivia from four seasons ago. Right. So. Awesome. Jenny Harper, are there any character sheets that list how each character changes kind of by beat, beat by beat? No, uh, we wouldn't keep a record of that. That would be crazy. That would be too much work. 
uh, is there a reason for a character or writer to keep that? I, I mean, I often would wonder, like when I used when I watch Lost or even Game of Thrones, I'm like, wait, who knows what here? Like, it's hard to remember. Like, that's the challenge of one of the challenges of shows like that. Wait, who knows? Who knows what's going on here? I, I'm terrible at that. I don't like that aspect of writing, but uh, certainly, um, what is that? So this is a book by uh, uh, Javier Grillo Markswatch, which we've talked about before. He was a writer on Lost, and he's got some like a blog where he talks about the kind of that first season of Lost, which he was on. And this is his book, Shoot This One Again, which is kind of stories, essays on being a writer and a showrunner. And oh, this cool. book is really good. And he talks a lot about like Bibles and like what it was like to come up with stories and things like that. And they've got a really great podcast too on TV writing that's not very active, but it was mm. really good resource. Yeah. called Children of Tendu. Yeah. So if you're interested in more of like the that stuff, I think that's they have a very, they're a very good resource for that. Yeah. Um, and that book's great. Check it out. But shout yeah. out to to Javi. Yeah. You you know Javi, right? You met him, is that right? No, I never met okay. him. I know who he is, though. You know of him. Got I it. think maybe we tweeted each other once or twice or something. Yeah, he's they're they're cool guys. I've, I've reached out to them as well to help them mm -hmm. with their podcast back in the day. They did not uh -huh. take me up on it, Michael, but oh, you did. Well. I did. Yeah. They missed out. Yeah. What are, Chris wants to know, what are some examples of compelling character development in television? Characters who really stand out from a professional writer's perspective. Well, I mean, Walter White, fantastic. But anybody on, on Breaking Bad is fantastic. Uh, you talked uh, about Arya Stark already. That's another great yeah. one. Jon there's Snow. so many great characters. I mean, when people think there's nothing good on, it's like, well, change the channel, man. There's plenty of good TV on. Yeah. You know, I don't know what you're talking about. Stop watching your terrible shows. <laughs> yeah, it's your fault. I'm, I'm loving success, uh, not uh, severance. I'm loving severance. Severance. Uh, it's so interesting to me. Yeah. Love it. Alex R. How in depth do writer do rooms of writers deconstruct characters? Uh, well, you know, we have an idea and we start writing and then the characters, it's not like we, de we deconstruct, they actually become, it's almost like they're real people to us. And so it's like, how, how do you, de you know, are, are you deconstructing your mother or do you just know your mother? You know, yeah, y you know who your mother is. And so they're real people. It's not like we're, we're not taking them apart and laying them on a table. Do you want to talk about the doctor? No, in the writer's room. Cause that kind of, that came up recently, like this week in a conversation with somebody, but it's also like, this might be that like someone, it's almost like you're nitpicking your character a bit. Yeah, but I don't know. I'm, I'm not a, I don't watch Dr. No, so I don't really. Can, no, Dr. Dr. No is in um, the Dr. No in the room. Maybe that's not oh. you. That's a them. Dr. No is the naysayer, the guy who says, oh. kind of tears things down and doesn't like. Yeah, I mean, that's up. not a helpful. There, there, you can find a reason to say no to every pitch in a writer's room. It's just not helpful, you know? So find a reason to, to build it up, to, to be positive and to say something helpful. How do you make sticky or awesome characters that get stuck in people's heads and hearts? And how can you have a character that you expand over more than one season? Like, how do you develop a character? You know, this is the journey we all put ourselves on. But again, I don't even think it's the so much the character as it is uh, the journey we put them on. You could right. take anyone, make them interesting, I feel. You could take, make anyone interesting as long as you put them on the right journey. You Got know? It. Dave Campbell. Uh, how do we get away with using characters based on real life when there's always that stupid boilerplate saying exactly the opposite? The characters and events are not based on real events or. How do we, I guess, what's the question? How do we want? How do we get Sorry. away with using a character that's based on somebody in real life oh. when there's always that stupid boilerplate, uh, the, you know, the disclaimer about this is oh. not based on real well, people? Well, change, I mean, change them a little. You're basing it on them and you're changing their name and their identity. And so, so you, you're not. It, if you're going to make a character against, you know, model it against your best friend, change it enough so that your best friend doesn't find out, you know, or yeah. won't know. So that's how you do it. I wrote a script once and gave it to my friend who's a, an actor that was on the bridge. And he, he was like a little on the nose, but I'm, in, I'm but I appreciate it. Cause he felt right. like I wrote him, which I did. Like I wrote right. him cause he was just such a character. Right. And he was like, it was not interesting to him as a an actor who has been on a major show. You know, it's mm -hmm. just like this is just me, right? So, right. Mishu Pizza can character foil can character foils also be considered a side character? 
uh, or a supporting character or the main character's best friend. I feel like foils don't always have to be the antagonist. Is that true? Oh yeah, yeah. I, 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 I feel like some. I feel like we're overthinking this a little bit. Um, I feel like maybe we're over. We're giving labels that don't need to be labeled. We have a hero. We're going to put this hero on a journey, and who are the people? Or if it's a two-hander, we're it's like a buddy comedy or whatever we're talking about or if it's a husband and wife or whatever uh, uh you know we're what's the story we're what's the journey we're putting them on and who are the characters who are going to get in their way and yeah. often if it's a husband and wife they're it's gonna, they're going to be fighting each other and so okay good and uh, and who are the characters that we we need to create to help help uh, foment this argument that they're this argument that they're yeah. going to have I think Workaholics is a great example of this because it was probably about three seasons in where it kind of clicked for me. Like mm -hmm. Anders Holmvik is the straight man. He is the protagonist who's like wants to be city councilman and wants to do this, but he's friends with these stoners. And you've got um, his Blake, who's a kind of a, he's basically a comedic relief. And then you have Adam and Adam is like, tearing him down or convincing him to do bad things all the time. He's kind of the bad mm -hmm. influence. And so he's kind of his foil or his antagonist in all of these things because he's just such a ridiculous character. And so it's a really good, fun, you know, three piece comedy group where they're just one person wants to do things kind of the straight way, but he always gets talked into mayhem by mm -hmm. one of the other characters and they're right. best friends and roommates. So you can't get out of that situation. Right. right. So it creates fun because there's that conflict all the time. Right. Right. Yeah. And so neither one's like, you know, yeah. So they're not, no one's a villain. No one's, no. it's just, and no one's even a foil. It's just like, okay, this, I want something and the other character wants something else. And there's, and there's rivalries conflict. in the office place, but they're not even like, they might be a, 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 a stumbling block for this episode, but they're not the centerpiece of the whole season. Right? Yeah. yeah. Right. Charles Shin, what is the process like working with a writing partner when most writers write alone? Well, my writing partner and I will get together and we'll talk about bang out an idea. We'll pitch ideas and bounce them off each other. Then when we start writing, we are literally sitting at the same computer. We have one computer and two monitors. Or now actually we have our mo we have two different computers, but we, we share a screen. So um, that's how we do it. Other, other teams trade. I'll do act one, you do act two, and then we'll, we'll punch up each other's stuff. That's not how we do it. We literally write every line together so that we're always on the same page. Are you doing any of that over Zoom or are you still meeting at each other's houses? Yeah, well, now, well, we did a little bit we did on Zoom, but now we, we we go to each other's houses. Yeah, I was wondering how COVID affected you guys because you guys live relatively close to each other. Yeah, we were still pretty, there was a while we, we were doing on Zoom, but now we go, we, you know. Uh, Lorenzo right. Savoya wants to know, any comment on the end of the screenwriter strike? Uh, yeah, I'm glad we, uh, yeah, I mean, a deal was reached. I think the writers... Yeah, we're pretty happy. You know, we were, it was ratified by about ninety nine percent of us. We voted yes, so uh, it wasn't uh, an excellent deal, but it was much better than we would have gotten had we not gone on strike. Uh, Helga G, is there any formula on when you start a story from the end and then start on how we got there? And sometimes the ending is not what you thought. Yeah, I mean, um, often sometimes you'll start on uh, the second act break, and how do uh oh how did we get here? Go watch Bound is a good example of that movie Bound. Um, it's often it's just a device. It's another way of telling a story. I don't I don't do it often. Uh, it can make a story a little more interesting because if it, if you have a lot of peril, if you're writing a thriller, that could be a good technique. Yeah. Uh oh, how did we get here? You know. Yeah, but then again, you don't want to spend too much time. You want to just open that story on that that one harrowing, you know, we're at the, we're on the it's about to be cut open by a buzzsaw. How did we get here? And then yeah. you know, so you're really just talking about one scene and then taking it back. And it can definitely be a cliche, right? The three days later or six weeks earlier flashback, that kind of thing. It can be a cliche. Um, so you got to. It needs to be earned. Uh, I think a little. Like Echo 3 is a show on Apple TV and it's about a bunch of Delta Force guys who go back, go down to South America to try to save one sister and the other one is married to his sister. And it starts that way with her being lined up on a pond and they're going to shoot these people and then you hear gunshots and then it cuts into three months earlier when they're at the wedding and these two are getting married and we introduce the characters. But it ends it at the end of the episode. 
So we, we end at the end where we started and then it gets us right into the next episode. And that's meant to be, you know, you're going to burn through the whole thing in one sitting. You're not going to sit there and go episode by episode. So I felt like they handled it, but the whole time it did click in my head, like, okay, this is one of those cliches of the pop backwards, you know, jump back in time. All right. Lucky Korea Carrillo. How do you approach rewriting a script that is fully complete and has 15 drafts, drafts already has notes and just sat on pause for a couple of years? How do you do it? You do it. I mean, I'm, I don't know. You got to, I'm not sure what the question is. Are you going to do it or not? Yeah. And I think this is something you've also said, and and I don't want to judge this and it's Lucy Carrillo, by the way, not lucky, Mm -hmm. but I I don't want to judge the the work because I have no idea what it is, but there's Mm -hmm. a great point you make, which is stop polishing that turd, right? Just move on. Yeah. And if something's been sitting there for a couple of years, like work on it. If you're several years and you come, if you, if skip it, go to something else. But if you've done that and you come back and you feel like you need to write it again, write it, just sit down and rewrite it. Yeah. Do it. If you feel like it's worth your time, but it's, it's a, time cost benefit analysis and there's also sunk cost fallacy here right which is you need to understand is it worth rewriting this thing or is it worth writing something new and if it's been sitting there for a couple of years it might be dated or feel that way already unless it's like time piece you know a, a set in time but the sunk cost fallacy is a real thing a lot of people get caught up in and it applies here which is i've already invested this much time in it i better keep going right. and right. The, the reality is the moment you feel that you should stop immediately and move on it's, yeah, because you've already you're already over invested in it. It's not worth right. continuing to go. Yeah, uh, David Campbell, two questions left, Michael. But don't we still need to know what the proper terminology for exterior or interior establishing shots are? And that was in relation to you telling them not to worry about formatting because software will handle that for them. Yeah, I mean, honestly, that's yeah. You need to know it, but it's not a, it's not hard to learn. Interior school auditorium day now you know how to do it exterior school playground afternoon uh, done you now you know everything I, you need to know yep you know that's it <laughs> yeah you describe the location what time it is it and we're done learning the formatting is not writing yeah writing yeah. figuring out your characters is a part of writing writing extensive biographies and backstories is not writing right? yeah that world building is not writing writing is writing you yeah. do these things to get to the point where you can sit down and write. And yeah. they're part of the process. Don't get me wrong. But you got to get words All on that the page. stuff you can Google is free. I, I don't teach that in the course because it's unimportant and it's all public. You can learn it from Google. Uh, and if you get it wrong, no one cares. So, Ask Chat GPT and they'll tell you. You know, it, like, I, like if you get it wrong, it doesn't matter. Well, it's final, just, and, and final draft, by the way, like you hit tab and you hit scene heading and then you type in what you need and then you hit yeah. enter and it automatically knows this should be a description and then you hit enter and then you, you know, command three and you're going to get a character. And it, it, like, it's just part of the process. Yeah. So. Yeah. Last question. Ah, last question. Can you ever talk about what's going on in the mind of a character? For example, he stares into space, his mind somewhere else. What about it? What's the question? Can you ever talk? Can you ever do that? Can you ever go into the mind of your character? Oh, uh, your scene description, I think, is what he's talking about. Yeah, you can. <clears throat> sure, sure. Uh, where you know, the, you know, she says she asked the question. You know, if you have, oh, let's say the uh, the wife wants to know what's on the husband's mind, and he's about to answer. Should he say it or not? You know, he's sitting on a secret. Does he open his mouth or not? You can put that in. You don't want to do too much of that, but uh, if it that, helps, the that's actor, style. That's style yeah. and voice. That's your style and voice. I'll tell you, I'll give you another example of this for mine. Um, the script that you read on episode 33 of the podcast, um, mm-hmm. Ripple, um, and then you sent me off to rewrite it. And then I gave it to a bunch of people after I did a bunch of research and rewrote it again. And there, I got this great compliment, but it was a bit of a back on a compliment. It's like, mm-hmm. I don't need you to tell me the character is mad in the scene description because it's a bit, you've already got an embarrassment of riches here. Right. So what mm-hmm. he's saying is the subtext did the job. Right. Me saying the character is mad. Like we infer that because of how well the scene is, where in the scene yeah. is in the subtext. So I was just overdoing it. It didn't yeah. need to put that there. Yeah. But that's prose. You would say he's upset thinking about his when he was 15 and his mother, you know, that's prose and that's noveling, novel and it's not screenwriting. Yeah. And but if you have a scene where the character is sitting on the bus staring out the window, wondering what has become of his life, you could say that. Yeah, you, you gotta know, act that out. It, it, 
it needs to be seen and a character an actor needs to be able to do it or say yeah. it is really what a screenplay is right yeah yeah you know so in a dialogueless scene you might want you might need something like that what is the character thinking about as he stares out the window of the bus yeah yeah awesome there you go woo everyone let's let's tell them what to look forward to phil we got lots of good stuff obviously this is a bonus episode for coming q a questions coming from your webinars which are happening uh, every three weeks if you're hearing this it means there's one tomorrow so oh. you should uh go register at michaeljammin.com slash webinar it's 100 percent free you hop on for about an hour you go through some pretty cool lessons and then you do some q a and uh i believe we're still giving away someone will win access to your course by oh attending. yes so that'll be good so if you want uh, access to Michael's course, just show up and someone's going to win. And we give, uh, we do it. We've done it every yeah. time so far, which is great. You've got your book coming out. You want to talk about that? Sure. It's called The Paper Orchestra. It's a collection of personal essays. And if you want to learn more about that, when it drops, go to michaeljammon.com slash book. Uh, and uh, it's a, uh, hopefully it's a fun read. And um, I hope to, hopefully it'll inspire you and you'll learn a little bit more about yourself as, as a person. Uh, and that's my passion project that I've been working on for the past four or so years. Uh, and that's just what I wanted to write. Uh, it's what I wanted to write for myself. So yeah. I think it's intimate and it's true. And it's, um, you know, as a, as a TV writer, I write what they pay me to write, but this is what I wanted to write on my own. Yeah, so. and, it's, and it's awesome. And, and anybody who's been lucky enough to see your live performances of that uh, are great. You're going to be doing that again in the spring, it sounds like. I hope so. Here, here's a here's a biz. You, you can see it's got a nice reflection on it. But yeah, go to michaeljammon.com slash upcoming if you want me to if you want to see me in person. I'll definitely be doing shows in L.A. and hopefully New York and uh, and and then some of the bigger cities. Hopefully Toronto and uh, you know hopefully a small it'll be a small tour and in some bigger some of the bigger markets that i'm in yeah awesome yeah outside of that lots of free resources at michaeljammon.com slash free so you can go mm -hmm. there you know samples of your writing you've got free screenwriting you know lesson uh, a bunch of good stuff in there and um yeah i mean you got uh your lots of social media at michael jammin writer kind of all over giving out free stuff every day yeah come follow along everyone and thank you for listening i got some really good guests coming up so uh if you like our podcast, go to um, go give us a nice review on Apple. You know, yeah, a couple, even, even just like a, and that's a written. If you if you have a second, just to write a quick note. This is great. Like this. Um, even if you hate it, I don't like this. That helps with <laughs> Apple. Uh, <laughs> but on Spotify or something, just hit five, hit the five star. Leave us a five star review. You know, wherever yeah. you listen to it, just hit us a review. It helps more people find it. Yeah. Thanks so much, everyone. All right. Thank you, Phil. Until next Bye. week. Keep writing, everyone. So, now we all know what the hell Michael Jammin's talking about. If you're interested in learning more about writing, make sure you register for my free monthly webinars at michaeljammin.com slash webinar. And if you found this podcast helpful or entertaining, please share it with a friend and consider leaving us a five-star review on iTunes. That really, really helps. For more of this, whatever the hell this is, follow Michael Jammin on social media at Michael Jammin Writer. And you can follow Phil Hudson on social media at Phil A. Hudson. This podcast was produced by Phil Hudson. It was edited by Dallas Crane. And music was composed by Anthony Rizzo. And remember, you can have excuses or you can have a creative life. But you can't have both. See you next week. <laughs>